everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Male Perspective. I am your host, Nalana Reed, and today, today on this day, I have with me a gentleman by the name of Mark Tuggle. He is the editor of an upcoming book called uh, Cultural Silence and Wounded Souls, Black Men Speak on Mental Health. I am so excited to talk to him. I'm so excited that this topic is more common in today's world. So I'm just I'm just excited about today's conversation and to be kind of the first one to be privy to some of this information that's coming out. But first and foremost, as I always do, I take a quick moment to pause, say thank you to you for making time for me today. Time is a gift. Once we give it, we cannot get it back. So I truly, truly appreciate you setting aside this time in your day to talk with me. And with that, sir, welcome. Welcome to the show. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with you. Awesome. Where, well, um, you're in one of my favorite, favorite cities. So please tell everybody where I'm speaking to you from. I'm in the village of Harlem in New York City. I love I love the cultural diversity and the spirit and the energy. I uh, just... New York and Harlem got it going on, got it going on. So kudos to that first and foremost. But anyways, let's get to, because I only got a short amount of time and I want to make sure I get to uh, your work that you're doing. So as I mentioned, you have a book that's coming out. And uh, as I was preparing for today's show, I saw that you have been writing and contributing to publications for many years now. So the first question I have to you is, why at this particular point in your life did this book come about? How did this book come about at this, this season of your life? That's a really good question, Lena. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I have my own mental health journey. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, generalized anxiety and moderate depression about 28 years ago. And for a long time, I never talked about how I felt about it. Even when I got the diagnosis from the holistic health practitioner, we never had a discussion about his diagnosis. And, you know, historically, um, Black men have never felt safe sharing their true feelings in this country. Mm -hmm. And I was the same way. But I just found myself having some very disturbing thoughts and unpleasant feelings. And I needed to talk about it. And God put this on my spirit because um, I know I'm not the only one. Yeah. So I decided that it would be helpful because I've always wanted to um, be of service to humanity. Um, I've always wanted to serve uh, young men of African descent. So I said, let me try to reach out to some people and hear their stories. And three and a half years later, dun, da, da, da. <laughs> this is a rough draft, you yes. know, um, but I, I've been in therapy. Uh, therapy is not a one size fits all solution, but it was very mm -hmm. helpful for me. Uh, I've been in support groups. Um, I journal, I meditate, I pray. Um, I like animals, nature, mm -hmm. um, music, comedy. So when I have feelings that, that are uncomfortable, unpleasant, I have options, I have choices, the things I can do. And I wanted to share that and want other people to share their experiences as well. Awesome. So you mentioned that this has been uh three and a half years, uh, a journey for you. Uh, and you've got some other people involved in that. My, my, how many other contributors are there um, in the project? 30 contributors, 30 contributors. Awesome, awesome. All walks of life, advocates, clinicians, educators, doctors, filmmakers, lawyers, journalists, scholars. I've been, it's an intergenerational anthology. Okay, intergenerational. So, yeah. Okay, so that brings me to the... Uh, question that a lot of people are going to ask uh, because this is black men in this book talking about mental health why is it that brothers have historically been leery pushed back against seeking mental health talking about their mental health being open to having therapy in the first place i mean why has that been an issue for you guys um in the 1800s there was a guy named samuel cartwright uh, he was a white supremacist. And um, when our ancestors were enslaved, the desire to escape slavery was called drapetomania. Mm -hmm. He coined that term. Mm -hmm. And so he classified it as a mental illness. And, you know, you read Dr. Joy Degree, she talks about post-traumatic slave disorder. Yes. And so, you know, going from the auction block to where we are now, you know, we just never had a safe space to share how we feel because of enslavement, 
the transatlantic slave trade, reconstruction, Jim Crow, all the lynchings, um, the police brutality, and so forth and so on. And we know that there are consequences when we tell somebody I'm upset, I'm angry, I'm resentful. Yes. And, yes. and when you're a little boy, you're rarely asked, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. And when you tell someone how you feel, sometimes you get feminized, you get bullied, mm -hmm. you get ostracized. Um, and that type of uh, trauma, emotional trauma, uh, can lead to isolation, uh, drug addiction, violence. Um, you know, so it's really important that uh, we have a place where we feel safe, where we are firm, where we are valued, True. Um, where we feel we can trust the person in front of us, like I'm talking to you right now. Gotcha, gotcha. That, that is centuries of unlearning and relearning, you know, how we think, how we feel, who do we talk to. It, it's, it's a journey. It's a journey. It's a it's a long journey, and I'm I'm glad we're slowly but surely getting there uh, with our brothers because you guys have been holding in and carrying some stuff for so many generations, and it's it's expressed itself, manifested itself in some very unhealthy ways. So I'm I'm glad we're at this place where many of you guys are starting to unpack that. You mentioned, um, you know, so I think you mentioned sometimes we have been mistreated differently with when it comes to different drug epidemics and stuff like that. And I was thinking as I was getting prepared for today's show, uh, back in the, the days of the crack epidemic, right? And that predominantly hit our black communities. And it was often a, um, a situation where you saw we were self-medicating, sometimes covering up mental illnesses. And in that time period, we were often criminalized. We weren't given the mental health services that we needed. And then fast forward to today, we're in the opiate crisis, right? Where, and it generally kind of targets the, or hits the white community. But all of a sudden, we need to give compassion. We need to give mental health services. So we see historically how uh, Black people and our mental health is treated differently in this country. But it also kind of, uh, brings into a bigger picture, as you were mentioning or alluding to, when it comes to the mental health therapy, it's still predominantly a white situation, researchers, therapists, whatever. How did you personally find somebody to connect with to say, hey, I can unpack here. This is a safe space for me because culturally, historically in this country, I just, I've never had that space to, to unpack. How did you find somebody? Um, for my own personal therapy or just yes. for, yeah. Um, I actually had a friend who was in therapy. Okay. And I was attracted to her spirit. Um, oh, okay. She told me what she had been through in her personal life. And um, I was diagnosed HIV positive 28 years ago. Okay. And um, at that time, doctors were telling people you have six months to live. Hmm. So um, my friend suggested that I join an HIV positive support group. Okay. Um, she said I should get a holistic health practitioner and she suggested that I get into therapy. And this is 94, right? I'm thinking therapy was for rich, crazy white people. <laughs> <laughs> that was my immediate reaction, my visceral reaction. Yeah. She's got to be kidding, but she told me she was in therapy. Oh, okay. And she was benefiting from the experience and said, I said, well, let me just be open-minded and be willing to try. And that's what I did, you know, and my therapist was um, 26 years old, female from Bosnia. Oh, okay. Like we were just so completely different, but I said, you know, what are you gonna do for me? And she said, I'm here to assist you with the quality of your life. Awesome. And that really calmed my nerves, my anxiety, you know, cause I didn't know why I was there. Honestly, I didn't know, I never talked to a professional about my thoughts and my feelings, my beliefs and my attitude. This was a whole new realm. Mm. So I saw her every week for three years. And she taught me about um, um, taking the food labels. She took me to organic uh, food stores. We would have sessions in Central Park. She okay. put me in hypnosis. We didn't even talk about HIV. We talked about the little boy on, on the inside. Awesome stuff. Awesome yeah. stuff. Today, because of social media, you can go to Instagram and connect with a lot of service providers. Um, people are doing podcasts now because you mentioned 
um, it's, it's kind of recent that Black men are actually talking about mental yes. health publicly. Because we've always had mental health. Everyone has mental health. Not everyone has mental illness. Yeah. So I think it's important to make that distinction. But mental now wellness, we have yeah. access. You know, yeah. Awesome. But one, one thing I wanted to say too, you know, you mentioned the crack epidemic, um, which has not ended. Uh, when Richard Nixon was president, he coined the term law and order. Yeah. His, right. So his, because he said that drugs was America's number one problem. Mm -hmm. In his budget, there was money for drug prevention. I mean, for um, uh, drug ed education and mental health uh, education as well. But that money was shifted to the military and the police. Mm -hmm. And that led to mass incarceration um, and the prison industrial complex. And so now the idea, you know, Bill Clinton, George Bush, Ronald yes. Reagan, you know, get tough on crime. So in New York, for example, when uh, uh, Mario Cuomo was governor, in mm -hmm. New York State, there had only been 35 prisons in the entire history of the state. 35. In 12 years during his tenure, they built 38 prisons. And most of the people in prison were black and brown people, uh, first time, you know, uh, nonviolent drug offenders. And now you, you, you can't get a job, can't get public assistance. You got that 10 year thing and the stigma, the shame, all that leads to mental health issues. Yeah, yeah, you can't get housing, you know, um, and I'm assuming, you know, and, and I, I think people don't really understand all the working pieces, especially for a brother, let's say you have a family or whatever, and, and now I've got this encounter with the law, I can't feed my family, I can't put a roof over my head, I can't, like you said, I can't even apply for services, you know, that, that stress adds to your mental health and well-being, not necessarily saying you're uh, in a straight jacket rocking back and forth, but now I'm depressed. Now I have anxiety or whatever. And, you know, I, I don't I think people understand the totality of everything that's going on that's impacting the health and well-being of our brothers out there. But like I said, we've got podcasts, we've got more awareness being come, uh, being brought to the forefront. So I'm, I'm just hoping, I'm hoping that we get there because, you know, as we see with Twitch, you, you guys need safe spaces to kind of unload because, you know, we don't need any more of those unfortunate circumstances to um, take place, which kind of uh, brings me to the next question that I have with Twitch. In your own journey, when you were going through your your mental health uh, therapy, how was your support system? You know, because the black community, we can be kind of hard. Did you have a strong support system, or were people teasing you? Or no, I mean, I I value my privacy. Okay. So, um, and your privacy is often mistaken for secrecy. Okay. So that, you know, you have that conflict, that inner conflict, you know, who do I tell, who can I trust? Yeah. Who's gonna give me the compassion and empathy that I need? Um, so there were people that I could talk to, but, um, and again, this is 20 years ago when this first started, when I became aware, you know, um, and awareness doesn't equal acceptance. True. So, it, you know, mental health is, is a journey. It's an emotional journey. It's a spiritual journey. It can be a physical journey as well, psychological. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I did have people to talk to. God has blessed me with people uh, who also have the same experiences. Okay. So I felt less afraid, less ashamed, less alone. And we could talk to each other. I was going to therapy. I was going to support groups. I was reading magazines. I was writing and, you know, talking to people on the phone. And so that it's only through grace and mercy and all the angels that he put in my path that led me to you. <laughs> so I can talk about this because... I know some people don't really have uh, what they need. And sometimes you don't even know what you need. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm assuming in your book, um, you show different brothers who have different stories, different varieties of what they used to get the help. Like you had a holistic approach, right? Um, yes. Were there other stories with other themes or other options they use to get help and, and mental wellness in their journey? Well, um, the book what is intended to um, offer some balance. So okay. I wanted to get a personal perspective and a professional perspective. Okay. So some people offer statistics, data, research. Okay. You have okay. people talked about suicide ideation, um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, violent trauma, 
uh, going to prison, um, drug use. Um, so everyone has their own uh, journey with mental health. But ultimately, the consensus is that therapy works, that support groups work, um, prayer, meditation, exercise, nutrition, um, yoga, acupuncture, colonics, nature, animals, music, comedy. Like there's so many options. Gotcha. You don't have to sit in, in shameless one box, one, coop, one cookie cutter. Yeah, thing. yeah. No, there's not because everyone is is is, is their lives are individual. And everybody know, we has all have the same beliefs and morals and values. You know, we're, we're black men, but some are in the south, some are in the east, some are in the west. Some are 25, some are 55. You know, then you have all the generational trauma. And then in my family, we don't talk about how we feel. Yeah, I think that's common in a lot of Black folks, yeah. It is. It's very common. So, you know, once I become a teenager, I'm out in the world, who do I talk to? My homies are not talking about how they feel. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's was, toxic, right? Exactly, exactly. So I don't feel safe telling you I feel hurt. I feel disappointed. I feel sad. I feel uncomfortable. I feel betrayed. I feel insecure. I didn't have that language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's important too, is that all these men, they're not dealing with the white gays, right? They're sharing their experience in their own world. I'm the editor, but they're telling their story. Okay. I'm just a vehicle, a conduit, an instrument. God is using me to share with the world, this is who I am. This is what I've been through, but now I'm on the other side of it, or I'm still dealing with it, or whatever it is, everybody has their own journey. So, you know, thank God there are choices, there are options, and there are solutions. I love it. I love it. Now, I also, one thing I really like when I, I first connected with you, I like the uniqueness of the title. How, how is it that you came with that title? And what's the underlying of well, all Well, cultural of silence. I mean, you know, we've been here for, for many, many uh, centuries. And culturally, it was not safe for a Black men to suppress his feelings. Mm -hmm. We had to make silence. Oh, we would, we would get killed, lynched. Um, brutalized, you know, this, we face all types of um, rape, um, murder, um, all types of heinous inhumane crimes against humanity just for speaking out loud. Mm -hmm. And you learn that very early on, what to say, what not to say, who to talk to, not to talk to. And then the woundedness, we are all wounded, right? My great grandmother was 97 years old mm -hmm. and she said, no one leaves this world unscathed. Mm -hmm which means that everybody hurts. But there's something unique about Black pain. You know, Black pain is not valued or celebrated in America, right? Not at all. Um, our Holocaust has not been documented, mm -mm. right? So America doesn't weep for us. When we hurt, we get blamed for it. We get blamed for it. Mm -hmm. So when you get blamed for how you feel, then you decide, I can't tell you how I feel. It's, it's really a, a cycle. Yeah. And I'm breaking the cycle. These men are breaking the cycle. And now the younger men can read these stories and they can say, you know what? I feel the same way. Okay. I can identify. I understand. I relate. Let me talk to my pastor. Let me talk to a life coach, a therapist. Let me talk to my parents. Right. Let me talk to my teacher. Let me talk to an adult who can help me sort through and navigate what I'm going through because I don't understand why I feel this way, where did it start? Because yes. sometimes we don't even know the beginning of the story. Why, why? It's a journey. And it's a journey. And you know, I think a lot of times as black people, um, we don't understand a lot of the black, the, the post-traumatic stress, like you mentioned, um, Joy DeGray, you know, and she, she really breaks it down. Um, we don't really understand why we feel a lot of the things we feel or where it's coming from. And nobody's really sat us down and explain, you know, why we're going through this. So to have these places where we can uh, go to, and just to have a, um, a friend circle or a uh, support circle, that's not going to shun us when we do, you know, uh, say, hey, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm feeling right today. I don't think I'm feeling good today. And, and your book exposes uh, the, the need for this, to have these safe spaces. I can't, safe spaces, it's just we can't promote safe spaces enough because you have, like you said, little boys, little girls at a young age, not knowing where to express themselves, you know? Lana, it, um, Black men are dying uh, at 
astronomical rates in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Yes. And that should not be happening. Not at all. Not you at know? all. And sometimes all we need is somebody to talk to. It's really just that simple. Uh, we just need someone to talk to, but then we don't know who to talk to. Yeah. So when you have people who are advocating, who are educating, uh, who have podcasts or writing books, who are having uh, support groups, um, then we start to realize we're not alone. Yeah. Or so, we're not unique in the sense that we're the only people going through anxiety, depression, isolation, stress, bipolar disorder, paranoid schizophrenia, mm -hmm. suicide ideation. There's so many dynamics going on the inside. And we really need a safe space. You need a safe space. And we space. need people that we can trust. But so then <laughs> this is this is my question, uh, because you, you've been on in the, this journey. How does the person, what's the appropriate, effective, uh, empathetic way to respond? You know, because I, I, I would assume the first choice of I need to talk to somebody would be a friend or a family member or whatever. What's the most effective and loving way to embrace the need and to respond when a brother comes to you and say, I just need somebody to talk to right now? Well, I tell people, if someone comes to me and calls me, you know, if you need to talk, I'm willing to listen. Mm -hmm. God gave me two ears and one mouth to do twice as much listening and half as much talking. So that's where my compassion and empathy comes from is, is from right here and from right here. And sometimes, man, all we need is the space, like pause is a space for grace. <sighs> So mm -hmm. we can just breathe and have someone to just, it may take two hours, right? Because I've had some long conversations like <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> yes. And it takes patience. It takes tolerance. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that person feels so, like they lost 100 pounds. Yes. And now yes. they know, okay, I have one ally in this planet. And that's how I get started. Because, you know, the um, one person, you know, each one teach one. Yeah. That's yeah. what it takes. But again, when we're taught that we're not worthy, mm -hmm. that we're not valuable, that we're not loving, there's so many racist messages about Black men that have been bombarding us since uh, we were stolen and mm -hmm. brought here and never got paid. <laughs> still, ain't, still ain't getting we paid. still ain't got paid. Still ain't you know, getting everybody paid. getting reparations <laughs> except for us. You got <laughs> Yale students getting reparations and they're white. Are you kidding me? Yale students are getting reparations. Yeah. Don't get me started, Lana. Don't get me started. <laughs> We're giving all this money to Ukraine. Yes. We're giving this man up $60 billion. We've been hit. We, we built been this freaking country. Built it. And never got paid. Nothing. Can't even get like, okay, here's four years free college tuition. Or if you don't want us to cut us a check or something, give us something, something, you know what I'm saying? You know, but anyway, that's all. Groups of people have gotten their just due, you yeah. know? Um, so those are issues that create um, anger and frustration and hostility because you just, you can only take so much. Yeah, you can. I mean, you have to look at um, like in the media, how they do, you know, like recently with uh, George Floyd, you know, with the murder of him, all of a sudden we got to figure out, we got to hear about his his past history or whatever. No, he was wrongfully murdered. His past history has nothing to do with it, but it's also, you see constantly how the media society projects black men as the enemy. And therefore, like you said, that contributes to the, I don't know where to talk. I don't know where to go to talk to anybody because everybody's going to perceive me as being angry, a threat, or, you know, potentially violent or whatever. So it kind of causes you guys to bottle it in because, you know, it, it's just, we got work to do. We got work to do. And I'm just, I'm just so thankful that you guys are out here doing the work because- We're doing what we can because, you we, know, the media is so powerful and those images that they're on the television and film and- you know, when you don't see yourself represented in love, yes, it's really difficult to feel like you know your life has as meaning and purpose. Yes, you, yes, you know? because because the bigger issue is it impacts how we as a community interact, as a black community interact with each other. You know, when we're all damaged, bruised, beat up, and hurt. You know, so you know until we all get this this healing and wholeness, I think you know we will you know interact with each other on a much better term. So, like I said, you know, I'm just. 
I'm just so, I'm just so, I'm so, so, so thankful. So, so thankful. Um, because, you know, I'm, I was born in the South. So this, for the book to be intergenerational, I come from old, old grandpas and great grandpas. And we don't talk about this. I come from old, great, great grandpas and grand, just pray about, baby, just pray about it. grandma. Prayer ain't going to help today. Prayer is not going to help today, you know? And, and I think that's what your book brings to light. Like we need more options. We need to worry about our diet. We need to worry about, you know, nature. We need to worry about all of these other components to get mental health on, on, on board. So it's, it's I, happening and it's happening in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, there's pockets over here, pockets over there. there. There's so many people that I look up to, um, people like Renshaw Miller, uh, Reginald Howard, um, Dr. Ed Garns, Yolo Kelly Robinson, um, Lorenzo Lewis, Marcus Smith. Um, there's so many men, Black men, who are doing this type of work. Yes. They inspire me. They encourage me. Because um, it can be discouraging at times. You know, it can be discouraging and it can be frustrating. And I mean, even with this book, after a year, I, can, I only had two people who were willing to write. You know, because initially my goal was to have at least 15 to 20 men. But after a year, I, I kept getting so much rejection and rejection and rejection and indifference. And, you know, I'm Mark Togo. I'm not LeBron James. Mm. I don't have 300 million people following me on Facebook. You know what I mean? Yeah, true. Okay. So, like, when I'm reaching out to all these people and I'm putting information in, 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 in the Instagram and the Twitter and the LinkedIn and Facebook and WhatsApp, I just get indifference. Because again, who wants to be transparent? Who wants to be vulnerable? Who wants to take off that mask that Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote about? Mm -hmm. Say, I'm hurting on the inside. That comes with great risk. Yes. You, and you're afraid you're going to lose something or someone because not everybody understands. Yeah. Okay. And again, historically, we have been blamed for how we feel. And so you don't feel like I can honestly tell you that I'm hurting. If you're an athlete, you can't you, you can't talk about pain. Mm. You can have a concussion, they put you right back on the football field. You got to make that money. All about the Benjamins. You're just you're just a, a enslaved person in a uniform for a team at that particular. Point. Yeah, I mean that's why I'm rocking uh, Bob Marley. You know, he says the what do you say about the mental slavery? Yeah. What was the song he he wrote? I can't think of the song right now, but he said something about mental slavery. Mental slavery. Um, anyway, mm. <laughs> we're, both, we're, both, we're both showing we're both open minded to uh, new ideas, new people, new situations, and um, let somebody in. You know, mm. let somebody in. Let somebody know that your heart is hurting. Um, and you know, let me hug you. Yeah. Right. And uh, give you that affection, that intimacy. That's another thing. So yeah. that's missing in, in amongst black male community sometimes yes. is, is intimacy because sometimes intimacy is viewed as uh, homosexual, yeah. right? So you, you you get feminized and people start to um call you out of your name and now you're less black, you're not you're not masculine because we have masculine issues and mm -hmm. it's just so much that we're fighting against. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So we yes. need each other. We need each other. And we got to be able to look at each other's eyes and say, you know, I love you. You're my brother. And I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, that's what I try to do. Uh, you, you're doing it. And I, I want to reel back because you were saying you were struggling at a point to uh, get some brothers to contribute to the project. Yeah. Um, and it, it's much needed. Um, why? And I'm assuming I'm well, let me say I'm not let's assume I'm hoping that there will be another book and another book with more guys and more guys and more guys contributing. Why is it important for brothers to kind of be transparent and tell their story and answer the emails and, you know, when and the LinkedIn's when Mr. Tuggle says, hey, I got this going on. I'm trying to make this happen. Why? Why is it important for brothers to get out there and start speaking up it, and sharing? It is so important for our own not just for our own personal healing, but for our families, our communities, um, the legacy of the, the next generation. So like my nephew, I want my nephew to know if he has feelings that are troubling him, he can call his uncle in New yeah. York and talk about it, mm -hmm. right? Because his father is not present. Okay. 
So because his father's not present, he's not having that male uh, energy. Yeah. Um, and that's really important when you get that as a child. You don't have that. You may find it in other ways that may be may not serve you. You know. So I want him to know that I'm here. Um, and I think that's important that we pass this on. So instead of passing on trauma, let's pass on truth. Oof. Yes. Right. Let's pass on love. Let's pass down healing and wholeness and wellness and um, affection, intimacy, friendship, brotherhood, uh, unity, flexibility, all those spiritual principles that we can practice, you know, and um, we learn from each other. So there's 30 stories here. Each one is its own unique journey. Everyone has their own vocabulary, their own perspective, their own worldview. And it's not one size fits all. You might read 30 stories and identify with one person. And that could be the one person that have you pick up that phone and say, I need somebody to talk to. Uh, yes. Sometimes it's just that simple. I need someone to talk to. And once the conversation goes, you start to remember what happened when you were five, 15, 25, because it's a two-way street. Communication is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get some relief. That's been my experience. Just talking it out, I, my body starts to, you know, yeah, okay. wusa. My body starts to wusa mm -hmm. and I become less tense and less stressed. And I still got pain, but pain shared is pain lessened. That's true. That's I don't have true. to keep it to myself no more. That's true. Because secrets will keep secrets lead to diabetes, hypertension, yes. strokes. Look at Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe was taught as a kid to not talk back, just like Jackie Robin was to, to the white folks calling him the N-word. Mm. And he, you know, he had he developed AIDS uh, virus, but he he had all the stuff on the Stress, intro. Stress, ulcers, everything. Yes. Yeah. Because everything that goes in has to come out. That's just the law of gravity. It's going to have to manifest itself some way. Yes. And we sometimes we turn in on ourselves because we just don't know. And you can, you're not wrong for not knowing. But again, this is why we're here to let people know, you know, you're not alone. And uh, we love you. We care about you. You know, call this number, go to this website, look at this podcast, watch this video, read this book, you know, and let's come back and talk about it. Yeah. And I'm assuming that, you know, you mentioned that you, somebody might identify with one story, but I'm assuming that if somebody reads the book, they might say, uh, I don't identify with these stories, but, you know, that sounds like, you know, my my brother so-and-so, or that sounds my so-and-so, you know, maybe you need to check this out, or maybe you need to, because sometimes you just kind of have to breadcrumb some people the information and be, oh, okay, yeah, I think I, I'll go see somebody now, you know. So I, I think, though, even though somebody might relate to one story or whatever, they might know somebody that's very familiar, you know, in the various stories. So it's, 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 I, I we're just, part of the human family. So we're husbands, fathers, uncles, brothers, cousins, co-workers, classmates, neighbors, friends, yes. you know, so if you were to read the book, maybe you'll see something in someone from your family, your friends, or a black man that you think could benefit from this. Yeah, just slide it on. Like, look, I ain't saying you need to read right, it, but right, you right. need, but you need to, I ain't saying you need to read it, but you yeah. probably need to read it. <laughs> You're right. Cause you, I think I've learned to be um, discerning about mm. how to express because you don't want people thinking that you're thinking that they are you just a whole <laughs> crazy thing and you know what I mean because that turns people off yes you know especially so brothers especially brothers yeah 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 because you know we got the ego the image <laughs> oh my god I, mean, I know you ain't calling me crazy what crazy I'll show you crazy you know <laughs> now we want to be Mike Tyson you know I know <laughs> he had a fight since he was 15 years old now we want to be Mike Tyson uh -huh. so you know it's a lot of unlearning and relearning that we have to do you know uh, but it's happening yeah and I'm just happy to be a small part of it you know God is using me and I, I'm just grateful that he kept me alive long enough so I can do something that can have a positive benefit on, on humanity yeah, we have to get volume two. We have to get volume three. We have to get volume four, you know. I've got some other ideas. Yes, you know, because like, you know, everybody's story is so unique and individual. And, you know, um, I, I think there's so many stories out there that people can relate to, you know. So I, I just think it's important that we just keep on having these conversations, keep on having these dialogues, keep on having people pour the information out into this world. Uh, because 
I, I sadly, I think, you know, it's, it's going to take our community to heal our community because realistically, they're not going to be, hey, we need to kind of help them out. So right, I, right. it's just not going to happen. So right. we're going to have to, you know, take ownership on some of this ourselves. And that's getting our stories out, you know, because like I said, it, it impacts how we interact with each other. So it's very important. It's very I think important. we have the greatest stories never told. Indeed, indeed, indeed. You know, I mean, I just... You know, when I, I think back on my elders and you were mentioning this, you know, a little bit earlier, you know, just having men in my family that don't don't hug, don't know affection or whatever, and how that general generationally affected massive amounts of cousins and you know, just little things, how it just kind of just kind of trickles down, trickles down that we need to really kind of unpack and fix and correct, you know. So <laughs> but, but let me ask you this, because a lot of brothers might say um, something like, and I've had this conversation before, so that's why. Uh, okay, okay, I, I'll go, I'll go see somebody, I'll go see somebody. Okay, I want to see somebody, it's done with. Therapy, you, it's an ongoing um, issue. Please explain that this is not one and done. No, it's not. Uh, and again, therapy is one option, yeah. right? And it's not a one size fits all. Yes. So, and um, some people see a therapist once a week. Mm -hmm. Some do it uh, bi-weekly. Some do it once a month. Some stop after a few weeks. Some stop after a few months. You know, I did it for three years and I did it again because my therapist, she moved on professionally. Mm -hmm. So I found somebody else. So I was in therapy on and off for about 10 years until I felt empowered enough to just cut that umbilical cord and, and move on with my life, you know? Um, but, you know, there's, there's life coaches, there are social workers, there's psychologists, there's therapists, there's all types of support groups, you know, um, and all the other um, ways to deal with how you feel, coping mechanisms. So yeah. even if you don't feel comfortable talking to a therapist, you know, get a piece of paper and write down your feelings for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes and just stop. Mm -hmm. See how that works. Pick up the phone and call somebody for 15 minutes, you know, um, Tune into a podcast. There are podcasts, a bunch of podcasts, right? You go to Instagram, yes. Twitter, um, Kizzle, Philip J. Roundtree. Uh, there's so many different podcasts out there. Um, and like I said, uh, prayer, meditation, um, journaling, music, comedy. Like when I'm not feeling my best, I'll put on Set of the Entertainer because I know he's going to make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and laughter is healing for the soul. Yes, yes. Something that simple that I never thought about 30 years ago. Oh. Because no one planted that seed in my head. Just have a laugh. Just have and a laugh. And you your grandfather, a lot of us don't have that generational uh, family structure anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes your family may not be the most compassionate people in the world. Mm -hmm. So you got to take a risk. I mean, that's what I had to do, you know. Um, but there are options, there are choices, there are solutions to your question. And, you know, this and, is and, and, and I like that you 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 tell everybody that, you know, it's an ongoing process. You know, when you find yourself having, you know, some down moments, you know what to do now. Because I think a lot of people feel that once you go through whatever it is in your journey to do your inner work, that everything's okay, but we still have bad days some days, you know, we got to, we know, we know, we now have the tools to deal with it when we do have our bad days, you know, but I think people are just mistakenly assume that everything's okay. Now, now that I've gone through the process. Healing is healing is a journey. Mm -hmm. uh, Deepak Chopra says that healing is the natural tendency to restore balance when it's lost. Mm. And so balance is really important for me, you know, balancing my mental health, my physical health, my spiritual health, because after I pay and meditate, I still got to pay the rent. <laughs> and if I can't find a job, that's depressing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And send so, me right you know, back down that spiral. Yeah. 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 So because depression doesn't mean you will have mental illness. Mm -hmm. You know, people experience seasonal depression, relationship depression, health mm -hmm. depression, you know. Um, but you don't have to go through it all by yourself. That's right. You know, and have it does take some courage to do what you don't feel comfortable doing, you know, taking off that mask and taking a risk and open up your heart because not everybody's going to be able to give you what you need. Yeah. And I've had to learn who to talk to and who not to talk to. 
<laughs> yes, that's the difficult part. That's the yeah. difficult part because, you know, a lot of us have people in our circle that we think are helpful ears, but they're just, you know, they can be more detriment. So it's very vital that you find the right resource to connect with the right person to talk to. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm just, oh, <laughs> oh you it's just, you gotta breathe sometimes. You just gotta yeah. breathe sometimes. Cause I just, I mean, you can see what the work that I do. My, my heart is just so with you guys that I know a large part of it is just finding the proper places to unpack and unload and unwind. And sometimes I know that that's not always there. So I'm just so glad that we're getting more of it out there. I'm just so glad. I'm just so glad. I'm just so glad. I mean, when you're in a space of all men, men typically don't talk about their emotions. Mm -hmm. They talk about everyone and everything else, but how they feel about themselves in the moment. Mm -hmm. It could be the boardroom, the barbershop, the locker room, the park, you know, wherever we gather, Mm -hmm. The last thing we want to talk about is how we feel. That's how we've been programmed and conditioned. We need a new program. Yes. Right? Stop watching HBO and create your own cable channel. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And find those people out there. And there are people out there just waiting for you. I have found my tribe. I love it. Right? And there are tribes out there, but it, it takes courage. It takes humility. It takes willingness, open-mindedness, um, <clears throat> and there's going to be bumps along the road. And again, healing is a journey. It's not a destination. There's no World Cup for healing. There's mm -hmm. no gold medal. There's no finish line. <laughs> there's no paycheck waiting. I'm not doing this to become rich and famous. Yeah. My God put this on my spirit so I can be of service to humanity, yeah. not just Black men, but their allies, their families, their yes. communities. Yes. So 5, 10, 15 years from now, maybe somebody will pick this book up and decide not to end their life. Yes. That's right. important to me because there's a lot of young uh, brothers who are ending their lives at very, I'm 62 years old. A lot of young guys are taking their life early. 40, you know, some of them are very famous. Mm. So, yes. you know, I think we need to talk about that. Yes, we need, we just need more spaces. You know, we just, we just need to talk about it. Uh, more well sir i'm I'm getting long-winded here i gotta um i gotta start wrapping this up so me and you could talk for a while here um when should we expect for the book to be out my tentative date would be black history month 2023 2023 and i'm gonna be sometime in february of next year 2023 and then um let me speak let me speak it to existence hold on so in 2024 uh we'll have the second one out <laughs> uh, let's get the first one out first. <laughs> first thing first. Don't get me into no trouble, Anna. People call me the phone. Where's that second book at? Where's that second, second book at? Uh, second book at. Uh, let's deal with the first one. You know. <laughs> All right. I just. It took I, me three and a half years to get this one right. But you know, mm -hmm. after you after you do the first one, the second one is always easier. And the, you is know, it? hey, you know how it is. You know, after you do it the first time, then it just. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, I, I have a friend who wants to do a documentary. Thank you. See, like I said, I we just thought about that, but he said, Mark, I just, you can use this in as a springboard to that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, because so. the more avenues and ways and, and mediums that we use to get the message out there, um, you know, it, it's just much needed because, you know, we, we produce more, we produce mentally more healthier, um, that, that's so wrong. That is so wrong. Healthier, mentally healthier, healthier, mentally healthier. Fathers, <laughs> uncles, teachers, uh, people we go to work with, the co co-worker in the next cubicle. I mean, we just produce a healthier environment. So, you know, the more we get this message out there, I just, and that requires Mark to put out volume two. So that's okay. all I was saying. That's all I was saying. That's all I was saying. And that's I just remembered Bob Marley said, emancipate yourself. For mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. There you go. Nothing but <laughs> ourselves, but free our none minds. None but ourselves. He was a prophet. Yes, yes. He was a prophet. Truly. Now, before I ask you my random question, because I, I promised you I was only going to take up 30 minutes, but I have taken up more than that. So I apologize for that. 
Um, but before I ask you my random question, I want to ask you, um, if there is a, a, a brother out there that is carrying the weight on his shoulders, and at the same time, he's carrying the weight on his shoulders, trying to tell himself and everybody else, I'm good, I got it, I'm fine. What would you say to that brother? Um, I have a couple of buddies that talk like that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm chilling, I'm mm. good. And then I'll say to them, how do you feel on the inside? Mm. And they'll say, Mark, no one's ever asked me that question before. Awesome. On the inside. I love it. Because sometimes, you know, we, you'll say feelings or emotions I love and it. you'll get stories. Yeah. I don't like my job. I'm tired of school. You know what I'm saying? You'll get a mm -hmm. story. But if you ask about the inside, it almost forces them to actually think about it. Okay. You know, emotional intelligence. Yeah. How do I feel on the inside? Now that you ask me that. They don't tell me the truth. Uh, okay. Okay. So we got a new we got a new tool to use now. Okay. I'm I'm start using that How question. How do you feel on the inside? Good one. I like because that. Because Yana Von Sant says everything happens twice: first on the inside, then on the outside. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I, I, I agree. So you left us with a tool to use. Okay. All right. <laughs> we got it. Let me ask you this random question, and then I'm going to ask you to tell us how we pick up the book, how we connect with you, how future contributors uh, can sign on for the next one. Let's see here, what we got here. Uh, <clears throat> if you could have an all expenses paid trip, where would you go? Ghana, Accra, Ghana. I, I, do, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I want to I'm... visit the slave dungeons. Yes. It's on my bucket list. So that's one, because I've been to, you know, I, that's where I want to go. Okay. Okay. All right. I, okay. All righty, dear. So tell us how we, uh, when it's available, where we're going to be able to pick up the book, um, how we connect with you to kind of keep on track on when it's what it released and everything. Just give us the whole lowdown. Um, well, again, um, my tentative date is February, 2023 on Amazon. Um, I can be reached at my website, um, www.culturalsilencewoundedsouls.com cultural silence wounded souls.com i'm available on twitter instagram facebook linkedin and whatsapp mark j tuggle t-u-g-g-l-e m-a-r-k-j tuggle awesome. so i'm on social media i'm i'm, I'm available holla at your boy holla at your boy <laughs> holla at your boy you know you know me <laughs> I'm, let's, let's, let's kick it. Let's chop it up. You know? Yeah, you know. I, I, mean, I enjoy dialogue, though, man. I really do. Awesome. You know, because, you know, even like with today's world, somebody could say, you know what, I'm in Seattle and I'm struggling, but it seems like this brother, you know, I like his spirit, his energy. Let me kind of reach out over the internet and connect with him. And, he, you know, he can, you know, mentally kind of help me through some things. You know, and I think that's the another beauty of today's world is, we have so many avenues and options open to us uh, with this technology to yeah. find the help that we need, you know? So when we don't have family systems or friend circles or somebody in our community, we can start tapping on this keyboard and where do I find the help? How do I pick up the book? How do I, you know, it's just, you know, we have some ways to kind of get the help we need today. So I'm- Sometimes I'm, you can just Google black men and mental health. Mm-hmm and see what comes up and yeah. I mean, Google, Google is Google. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and that's well, before we go, I, I think that's another thing people might want to kind of dump it all in the same bucket and not really understand. And you kind of touched on it. Black men and mental health need different um, avenues than white men, white women and mental health. You know, there just needs to be a different cultural understanding um, because I, I think sometimes people want to back it up. And I don't want to start talking again because I had just finished everything. But anyways, I, <laughs> we'll talk. We'll probably get you on board for the next book. We'll, we'll have to bring you back for the next book. But anyway, sir, you just keep healing, keep being whole, keep touching lives and and uh, bring it in a little bit more closer. Bring it in a little closer so we could see there. Could you bring the book? There we go. There we go. That's a rough draft, y'all. That's a rough draft. Coming soon. Coming soon. You saw it here. You saw it here. When did we get it? Yesterday? 
I got it yesterday. I was I was happy to run away today. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. Yeah. Well, sir, I have truly enjoyed, enjoyed myself. Good. I have truly enjoyed myself and the information that you have shared. Um, I just, I'm so proud and pleased. Thank and you, thank you, and just, I appreciate you um, taking the time to connect with me. It really means a lot. It means a lot to me that you're doing what you're doing, being a servant. Anybody who um, takes up that uh, burden of being a servant, I truly appreciate it because it is no easy task. So I truly appreciate you and, and continued success, healing, and wholeness. That's all. Thank you, oh. Lana. Same to you. Have a awesome. great night. That's all for this week's episode of The Male Perspective. I'm your host, Lana Reed, and I will see everybody next time. Thank you.